welcome to the Built on Air podcast, the variety show for all things Airtable. Each episode, we cover four different segments. It's always fresh and different and lots of fun while you get the insider info on all things Airtable. Our hosts and guests are some of the most senior experts in the Airtable community. Join us live each week on our YouTube channel every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And join our active community at builtonair.com slash join. Before we begin, a word from our sponsor, OntoAir.com. Any business running on Airtable gets the value that Airtable has, but also needs a few more functions to complete their operations. That's where OntoAir comes in. It's a suite of tools for any business running on Airtable to maximize your operations efficiencies and automations. One customer, John, states that OntoAir enables his business to function properly without having to think about building their own software, and that is pretty invaluable. The OntoAir Airtable apps are amazing, and we use them often and are very happy with the results. So join John and hundreds more customers and take your Airtable to the next level with OntoAir. Sign up today with promo code BUILTONAIR for a 10% discount. Check them out at OntoAir.com. And now let's check out today's episode and see what we built on air. Welcome back to the Built on Air podcast, season 11, episode three. Good to be with you again this Tuesday morning. Myself, Dan Fellers. We have a special guest with us, Tim Alexander. Welcome, Tim. Hey, thank you. thanks so much for having me. Yep, we're glad you could join us. We'll learn more about uh, Tim's story later on in the in the show, and we'll learn more about uh, Tim's story later on in the in the show. And we'll also have Camille joining us. Um, she's just running late, so she'll be with us in a few minutes. Um, Ali could not join us um, down with uh, COVID for this week, so wish her well. Hopefully, she'll be back with us next week and feeling better. Um, so with that, let's get started for today's show. As always, the Built on Air podcast is roughly an hour long. We go through a couple different segments and help each other learn more about the world of Airtable. We always start with around the bases, going through the different communities, see what's going on with everything and talk about the latest. And then we'll do a spotlight on Onto Air, our primary sponsor. Then we'll learn more about Tim and his background and story and what he's up to. And then Tim is going to walk us through a uh, application that he's uh, created and working on. And we'll walk us through that. So we'll learn more about that. Then we'll do a quick plug for our community, for those who haven't joined yet. And then finally, if we have time, we'll uh, do a scripting time, which was what we were going to do last week, but ran out of time. So we'll see if we can get to that today. So that'll be the the show for today. As always, we'll kick off with our round the bases of what's going on in the Airtable community. Welcome to all those uh, listening live and watching live with us. Um, This week, there wasn't a whole lot going on. So um, I just have a few things I want to talk about, but I thought it would be interesting if anybody listening or watching um, has anything uh, worth discussion, feel free to drop some links if you know of any um, topics that are worth talking about in this segment. Drop us some links and um, we'll bring them on and, and discuss them. So if, uh, if you saw anything interesting as you're browsing the internet that's Airtable related, um, put the link in the in the discussion thread and we'll we'll talk about it. So a few things. There was a couple announcements. Um, the first one, we actually broke this. Uh, I believe Scott might have been who's listening or watching uh, might have been the first to break this. Um, we saw this in the comments. Kavan, I think, posted it here as well. So somebody broke this for us um, while we were on the episode last week that they increased the automation limit. So now you can get up to 50 automations from 25. And um, so that's a huge plus for anybody doing a lot of automations and um, glad that they increased that. So that's in conjunction with um, the ability. I think previous to, to this, they... They had um, added the ability to create segments within your automation so you could organize your automations better. And now that you can organize them, 
they increased the limit. So that was very nice. Um, they haven't increased the number of automation runs you can have each month. Uh, maybe that's the next big announcement that they make, or at least have some ability to, to pay for more or something along those lines. Cause I know a lot of people run into limitations on there. So that's, uh, that's good to see uh, increase in automations. Any thoughts on that, Tim? I don't know if you're involved on that side. I, you know, uh, I, I, I find it, I just find it very interesting. Uh, I mean, I, you, we'll, we'll talk more about you know like what, how I've come into the Airtable world, but I find it very interesting what Airtable is doing because it really just kind of like moves where you put the automation from. Kind of you know, I guess any where the places we probably have traditionally in the past you know five to ten years. And it, when they're doing things like just opening it up more, it just make it just makes so much sense what they're uh, what they're doing because it's 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 gonna keep pushing more and more people to be like, what is this thing? And you know, like, yeah, I, I love this. I, I think it's I yeah. think it's so exciting what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, it goes from really being. I think you know, I still remember when they launched automations, and um, it went from being just you know, a memory storage location that was easy to access your data to really becoming the brains of, of your data with automations. And, um, and that really, I think is, is the future of really Airtable being kind of that, that, the, the real brains behind any processes, procedures, data, you know, workflows, um, and automations is core to that, to be able to, to, to make your data come to life. Yeah. So um, good to see that they're working to push the, the limits there on what you can do with automations. All right. There is uh, one more announcement that this just came out uh, yesterday. So um, integration with Miro. Miro is a tool, kind of a visual um, designer, allows you to, to, to create mock-ups and mind maps. And um, I've seen some cool stuff. I'm not a Miro user. I use actually, I think somebody commented, uh, I actually use this Whimsical, which is a newer player in the space that, that's kind of cool. Um, but it looks like they're, they're integrating with Miro. So now you can have, um, you can have Miro as a sync source. So you can actually pull data in from Miro into Airtable. So all of like your elements that you're designing in your Miro board, um can be referenced in your in your Airtable data so that's a that's an interesting integration i'd be curious if anybody's planning to utilize that um that's probably not something i'll be playing around much with but um i do know actually i have some clients that use miro so it'll be interesting to see uh how that goes so that's uh if anybody out there using miro feel free to check out um, this new integration that it looks like it's live, but they're not formally uh, announcing it until later this week. So this is a, a pre pre announcement that went out yesterday. So wait, how is that supposed to work? Is is you're supposed to drag like you pull the nodes that are in Miro into Airtable? I believe, yeah. So you'll basically, if you've ever done, if you've ever used their sync from other sources. Um, yeah, so it looks like they'll they'll create like a record for every node or every element within Miro. It kind of is interesting because I don't know how it maps one to one with like a record. Mm. Um, you know, it's not a natural data source like some of the others that are more of a re relational data source stream. And we've got Camille here joining us. Welcome, Camille. Good to have you. Hello. Welcome. So we're in the middle of talking about uh, yesterday they announced integration with Miro mm -hmm. and to figure out what that what that actually means. Um, so it'll be interesting because it's not the natural uh, sync source like some of the others that, that feel more like a data sync, you know, like a Google Sheets or sure. email or things like that. So Miro is kind of different. Was there an app that... Or am I thinking they do, of they do have, I think there is a Miro app, but I think that's just to kind of see your Miro boards within the, the sidebar. 
Um, this one actually is a sync source where it'll actually kind of sync all your Mira, Miro uh, components into records. So interesting stuff there. Got it. Uh, yeah, moving on. Like I said, if you if you're just joining us, um, if anybody has any any interesting topics that you want to throw out there, put the links in the in the chat. Um, otherwise, we just got a couple of Twitter threads that I thought were of interest. Um, so this one I thought was interesting, posted by uh, Microacquire. Um, somebody else kind of called this out that. Uh, you know, there's a, this is a Airtable plugin for sale. So Microacquire is a, is a marketplace for maybe smaller end um, software products or software companies looking to get acquired. Um, so here's probably one of the first Airtable plugins for sale. Um, it doesn't give the name. I maybe have some guesses, um, but it's a profitable Airtable plugin for accountants and personal finance users. And um, it says it's uh, doing 50,000, uh, assume that's annual. Yeah, drilling 12 months. And they're asking $500,000. So if anybody's looking to get into the game of the Airtable plugin world um, and uh, have some cash to spend, here's an option for you to buy. <laughs> Camille, here's a, an avenue for you. I'm confused at what this is. Is it an extension? What is the new word? It's extension, right? Uh, it's still apps. I thought it was changed. It, I got I got an email and I forgot what the email said. It's coming. It's coming, but not okay. not announced yet. <laughs> all right. Well, dropping all yeah. sorts of just just new 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 things. I don't know the what's box. known anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um. I'm, I, I don't know what this is. Yeah, yeah. I know there, there's only really, there's maybe two that I know that are out there that are kind of plugins for personal finance. Um, what does it do? Like, is it, is it like some, well, I can't even use Onto Air as an example because you have two new apps in the marketplace. Yay. But you also have things that um, exist on a separate sort of server right. that, you know, use the API key to do right. things outside of Airtable with Airtable data. If, I don't if it's know. The one, if it's the one I'm thinking of, um, it's not an app or extension. Um, it sits, it's, I think it will pull from uh, like your bank account and push data into Airtable. So it's more of a kind of sync between um, your bank and Airtable to, and maybe it has kind of a, a base structure, a predefined, you know, base structure on how to manage your personal finances. All right. So, but it'd be interesting if, especially if it sells for that price, I would be um, surprised, but that would be cool. So good luck to whoever is behind this. Um, if you want to demo it on the podcast, we'd love to have you on. Let's talk about that. So, or whoever buys it, come on the show and let us know. <laughs> so I thought that was worth um, putting out there if anybody's interested in that. Um, here's an ongoing, always you know, relevant topic. Uh, what do you do when you need more than 50,000 Airtable rows? This is a common question that comes up quite a bit. So I thought it was interesting to see some of the, um, some of the options that, that people throw out there. Um, Andy just says, you know, it's always um, situational. Uh, the good news is, and we, we broke this a couple of weeks ago, that they have increased or are increasing the limit at the enterprise level. And hopefully that's coming to the pro level soon. So the enterprise level is now at 250,000 across the base or 100,000 for an individual table. So hopefully those limits um, will, will trickle down to other plans. And um, then other people mentioned um, some alternatives. So there's a product out there that I've played with a little bit called Xano, X-A-N-O. And that does a um, sync with um, 
allows you to bring your Airtable data into a database, uh, like a Postgres database. And there's also a new product out there, newer. Um, gosh, what did they change their name to? It was Sync SO, and it, they changed their name to, you remember Camille? No, I didn't know they changed their name. Yeah, they changed their name. Shoot, dang it. We've had them on the show before. My bad. Uh, yeah, if anybody remembers. I, I quite liked that. Um, the Sync SO. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'll be Googling in the meantime. Yeah, yeah. Google that and let me know. Um, so some other options. Um, this is an alternative. I looked into this. This Blaze No Code is another no code competitor out there that I hadn't heard of before. Um, I always like to see who else is getting into this Airtable game. Um, Base Row is one we've talked about. Um, other people talk about, you know, just how to structure your data to account for, to account for um, dealing with that and ways that you could archive it. So it's a good thread. Um, it, uh, you know, it's always good to, to be aware of that um, and, and how you're going to deal with that. Because if, if you're a company of any decent size, you likely might run into this. Depends on how you use Airtable, of course. But, um, but yeah, for sure, I've got several clients that, that are hitting the, the limits and um, have to figure out ways to archive and, and, um, and ways to reduce the, the data usage. So there are a couple options out there. All of them kind of take some some labor to uh get working but um yeah any any update camille i'm working on it i am no, again no. i did not know they changed their name at all yeah and now it's going to gonna haunt me for the next however long it go takes. to sync.so and see where it redirects you it didn't redirect me oh maybe they didn't change their name what? why did i think they changed their name <laughs> Did you put me so, on a wild yeah. goose chase? <laughs> Sync.so is for sale, so something's changed, unless it's spelled differently. Sync.so is for sale. I was thinking uh, of Sync Inc., which is a different. Yeah, Sync Inc. Sync Inc. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't know. I All think right, it's Sync Inc.so. I am going to lose my mind quietly. <laughs> ignore me for a while. <laughs> All right, all right, that works. So cool. So that's kind of uh, what's going on in the world of Airtable. We didn't get any um, any requests for topics to to discuss from our community. So kind of a quiet week. Um, those are good to have. They've we've had some busy ones in the previous weeks, and so um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see if things pick up next week. So with that, we'll move on from Round the Bases and we'll talk about On to Air, which is an all-in-one toolkit to run your business on Airtable. It's a suite of apps that allow you to extend your business with Airtable usage, do a variety of different things. And in today's spotlight, we're going to keep with our theme from last week. We talked to, we went into a deep um, discussion on on the new On to Air schema that's now in the marketplace. And we're just starting to roll that out and work out some of the kinks and get it all ironed out. But I wanted to talk about, um, I've gotten this question I've had, as I've talked to people um, testing it out and they, they always, or they'll often ask like, how does it compare to the schema app that Airtable has? And so I wanted to just kind of do a quick compare and contrast of the schema app um, so up here, right here, you see this is the, the base schema app that, that Airtable provides in their marketplace um, that's free. And, um, you know, really, this is very similar. We actually, um, they actually were kind enough to open source their, their design for how they do the layout, which we um, borrowed uh, and based ours off of. But... This is pretty limited as far as what you can do. You can kind of see um, relationships between fields, but um, you can't see what type of fields these are. There's not a whole lot of 
functionality that you can do here. So it's really just a visual way to just kind of see what, what you've got in your base. If you've got a base that's large like this one, it's really hard to maneuver around and whatnot. And so if you think about it, we, I always kind of compare our schema app is kind of this base schema on steroids. That's a kind of nice proof of concept, but if you really want real functionality, then check out our schema apps that's down here. Initially kind of looks the same, but the big difference is this, you can see every type of field that it is. Um, it will highlight and it'll give you the, the name of the field. So if you're zoomed in, you can easily see what's going on. It has the relationships, um, but then you can go much deeper. You can click on any field and get all the information about that field, the, the, the meta information, all the fields that it's linked to. You can quickly jump between them. Oh, my mouse is acting up. Um, and you can see the relationships. So for a record link, you can see where it's linked to, quickly jump to that field um, and see all the relationships, both inbound and outbound relationships. Um, you can see what views this field is visible in, and you can also keep your own notes and information that isn't stored in the um, field description, but this is more notes that you can keep for yourself, and it will display those notes when you hover over um, any of the fields. And then also the big thing is, is you can um, create... Uh, snapshots. And what a snapshot is, it's essentially a backup of your schema. And then it will create a diff and show you all the changes that happen to all of your fields. Anytime you create new tables, you can see an audit trail of all the changes that are made to your schema information. So super powerful every time uh, you know a field was modified and you don't know why, you can look through this and it will help you figure it out. Um, it will help you see what it was linked to and um, or a formula field. You can see the formula. You can see how it's changed. And so you can see the lifetime of the, the formula. So extremely powerful if you're managing any kind of large database that's relevant to your business. Um, I think this is a must have component for um, for managing your base. So check that out. Just click on add an app. And you'll find us in the marketplace, search for Onto Air. You'll see one of our three apps that we now have in the marketplace. So ontoair.com, Ontoair Schemas is our schema app. <clears throat> Let's move on. Before we do, I found yep. it. They are you now Sequin. Sequin, that's right. Sequin. Yes. Sequin.io. That Sequin. was going to kill me. Shout out to Sequin.io, formerly Sync Inc. So that was it. Still starts with an S. So yes. Very good. Thank you. All right. We have with us Tim Alexander coming from I want to say Australia, right? Yeah, I'm I'm originally from the US. I'm from New Jersey, but I live okay. in uh, Bondi, uh, Sydney, Australia. Very cool. Awesome. How long have you been down there? Uh, since mid 2020, like April 2020, I moved down here. So kind of okay. like right at the height of the pandemic. Yeah. Okay. Hell of a and time to just... move. Yeah, <laughs> I, I fully noped out. I literally was like, have, have, let's go to an island. Nice, nice. And what took you down there just for fun? Uh, my um, my fiance and um, uh, is, is from here and we wanted okay. to have our daughter down here. And um, uh, it was just, you know, when you when you date somebody from another part of the world, then you early in the relationship you kind of have the conversation: Are you willing to move here or there? I'm like, so we're we're kind of we kind of live on two sides of the world now. Half the year, like this coming August, I'll be I'll be back in the New York area until probably about December. Uh, we're basically just avoiding uh, winters. That's what we're we're basically trying to do. Fair. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you uh, tell us your your story? How you how you got to where you're at now? Tell us a little bit about your work experience and anything yeah, else sure. you want to share. Yeah, so um, uh, yeah, so I have always sort of been an integrations guy. Um, I started off at a small corporate tax software company uh, called TaxStream that got acquired by Thomson Reuters. 
uh, and I was the integrations guy there. And then I, um, uh, I went to TIBCO, which is a pretty large uh, uh, integration and analytics firm uh, that like, they're like a $1.6 billion company that no one's ever heard of, but yep. they're, they're in everything. I have heard of them. Software. Yeah, they're <laughs> huge. So I was working for them on, on the Spotfire side. So I competed, I used to compete against Tableau. Uh, and then I worked for a small, um, well, medium-sized uh, uh, events uh, software company, event uh, event marketing company called Splash. So if you ever went to an event that's splashthat.com, I was the guy who was defining how the integrations worked with Marketo and Salesforce and stuff like that. Um, and then- uh, Isn't that, uh, I think Airtable uses Splash. Yes. That. That's exactly right. In fact, funny enough, Jordan Scott from Airtable used to work uh, on the Eloqua team and uh, on the uh, the Tableau team. And yep. I've done integrate. Me and Jordan know each other from completely different lives. Ah, uh, interesting. Um, so uh, I worked for that for Splash for uh, a long time. Love those guys. And then um, I moved down here, and the the Splash work wasn't going to really work out. And so I. Um, uh, I wanted to go into consulting and kind of get into, um, uh, I ended up creating Sync Foundry, which is, which owns DataFetch and is, uh, is my consulting kind of arm. And, and I was consulting for uh, like a, a bank and then ultimately was consulting for a company called Goldcast, who I also am an employee of and I'm the director of product there. So Goldcast is a virtual event software company that everyone should be checking out as an alternative to like hop in in that kind of world. So that's like me on a personal level and kind of a career path. Uh, but as a product manager um, for at both Splash and now Pro and at Goldcast, uh, I was I was using um, Jira of all things, and I was uh, I found this Google Sheets connector that um, made it so that I did no longer had to go into into Jira to go get my data, and I could like it just made my life so much easier to get the data to come to me where I was. And it was just, it, I became obsessed with that idea that we live in this world where all these companies are coming at us and saying, we've got APIs and we've got all this stuff and we've got, we can make your life so great. And they want to make you come into their world. And I'm like, I just want, I just want the data. I want the one thing that I need from you to come to me where I am, you know, come meet me where I am. Don't make me Go get certified in your crap, but don't get me. Don't make me learn another paradigm for another UI. And so I got obsessed with this, and I was like, I wanted to go build something that would make data come to me. And I started in, in uh, Google Sheets, but um, I kind of stalled there. And I also saw a lot of people were doing the same thing. And um, so eventually, I was like, well, like, what does it mean for data to literally come to me? Like, where am I always, a hundred percent of the time? And the answer was Slack. For me, 100% of my time right now, even though you were all on a podcast, I could still technically receive a Slack on my phone or something like that. So I'm always there. And if I'm communicating with people on my team, especially in the COVID world, it's through that. So um, I kind of just started kicking around this idea of like, what if I made a Slack command that um, could kind of do everything you know it would like what if you made the google of slack commands because you know you don't go like it's like everyone everyone already knows how to use most of these slack like the slash commands right they the if you had know how to use giphy you know how to use zoom uh like the remind command a lot of people know how to use that stuff but then all of these other apps you know like oh yeah hubspot has a slash command and oh yeah you know insert name of company they have a slash command too and they all work differently and you're not going to use any of them because you're not going to remember to use any of them you're just going to go to that tool i don't i i don't like search every website in the world for the thing that i'm looking for i just go to google and the stuff that i need surfaces up so what data fetch is is a slash command that you can use slash df or slash data fetch and pull data from basically anything. And, um, you know, so we went from, we, we've got Salesforce, HubSpot, Marketo, uh, Confluence, Notion. Uh, we've got Redshift and BigQuery and, you know, Postgres, and we've got all sorts of stuff. And everything that we've been doing has been very much based on talking to um, 
customers, users, whatever. And um, there's a co-working space that I'm uh, a member of down here called Fishburners. And I was like, well, what, what do you guys use? And the first thing they said was like, we use HubSpot and we use Airtable. And Airtable is what runs the entire back of our platform. And it, would be, it had been like the fifth or sixth time that I'd really um, gotten an indication that I should be paying a little bit more attention to Airtable than I was. And so, um, yeah, I did, we, uh, Fishburners has been extremely generous with, uh, working with me to kind of, uh, uh be, a te- a be, be, um, guinea pigs for me to, uh, uh, come up with some use cases. And now we have rolled out this functionality or we're about to start rolling out this functionality publicly that, um, allows, well, it allows users to search a slash command and it's completely powered by Airtable with no code. So um, I think I'm, I'm doing something kind of different from what everybody normally does with Slack, which is I can send a notification. That's great. I'm sick of notifications. And um, uh, I'm doing something very different from the person who has a very similar name to me. I know uh, uh, data fetchers out there, data fetcher in the Airtable world is, uh, you know, a, a big, I get it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but we're yeah, going to clarify that we had the data fetcher uh, yeah. uh, last season. So. <laughs> I was, I was waiting for the time to sort of yeah. point sure. out the differences. Data fetcher, uh, who was on the show before, uh, brings data into your Airtable base. So right. if you, you know, have a partner um, agency or whatever, you could have it all and look at all in Airtable. But data fetch io what you guys are doing is allowing you to stay in slack and pull information from airtable or from hubspot or from all of these other different services yeah so very different similar names yeah yeah that's exactly right um i don't i don't know some someday me and andy cloak are going to be in a in a a conference together we'll have to like arm wrestle for it or something but But you you (laughs) launched first right so we'll give you we'll give you that credit (laughs) <laughs> you know, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll leave that off about the podcast. Um, but, um, but yeah, so that's, that's what, but that's what it is. It's a, I, I, what I, I consider myself to kind of have the fastest demo in the world um, because it's literally just, Hey, I'm going to do a slash command. It's going to pull data. Um, but the, the power in this thing is the uh, it's the use cases. So it's, you know, it, the same way that the power of Tableau, is not the fact that it makes charts, but it's about how you apply it, right? So it's like, what can you do in the, the sales team? What can you do in the marketing team? What can you do in a fraud department? Well, with data fetch, what we've been able to do is say for communities, like let's say we, let's say we were implemented in the built on air community, then we would be able to hook up to your air table to make it so that anybody in the built in on air community can search for each other with way more, you know, like, you know, uh, search terms like, like, oh, I'm a consultant or, oh, I'm a developer or, oh, I am, you know, a podcast host. Um, if you wanted to make the directory searchable in that way, uh, or if you wanted to have company, the list of companies that are, you know, the, the ones that there are special perks for being part of Built on Air, like whatever it is. Uh, so right. community has actually been a surprising play for us. Um, customer support, you know, like that, that's actually a big one for us. The, um, the ability to take the data that exists inside your own company and operationalize it, not by telling people, here's a new dashboard, here's a new thing to learn. But instead it's like, you remember when you were able to send that GIF? Training's done. Training's over. You can now pull up statistics about our company. You can pull up, you know, like you can run queries based on our data warehouse you can do whatever you want that's what we're that's what data uh, data fetch is really doing very cool all right that's awesome any any questions camille other than before we jump into the product it wasn't really a question but you started your well at some point during your story i believe you said what if i made a command that did everything and i was like oh (laughs) okay I guess, I guess that's just what you can do now. That's cool. My, it's a, it's a command that 
it, it functionally, and it, it maybe it makes more sense for it when I show it, but functionally what it's doing is it's a single command slash DF or slash DF, but DF is faster than type. So slash DF, and it takes in whatever words you, you type in after that, the same way that the Giphy command does. And then it syndicates that search term to any of the platforms that you have hooked up to it in real time, returns the data back to a in-memory cache on our servers, sorts it, and then gives you a list that you can go through to say, here are the results that it found across any of the systems that you have searched it on. So um, if you have just an Airtable, it just searches your Airtable. But if you have like five systems hooked up, then it will search all five of those systems and you can configure what the templates look like on each one. So you know you want an, you want a custom specialized way of pulling back data from HubSpot. We can we can make that happen out of the box with no code. Very awesome. Cool. Should we All take right. a look? At it? Yeah. Why don't we? Um... Here, I will share my screen. Okay, yeah, so we'll get into uh, datafetch.io. So if you're just watching this segment, go back to the previous segment and you'll hear Tim's story and how datafetch come, came to be. And so with that, I'm going to put your screen on. All right, there you go. Awesome. Okay. Um, so this is just a demo base that I put together that has a list of every, uh, the, uh, like the top, or the most recent 1,000 um, uh, Y Combinator companies. So it's basically scraped right after, right off of the Y Combinator site. Um, I am going to be in this Slack here in Widgets Co. I'll make this a little bit bigger so people can see. And you know, let's say that I wanted to look up companies that had something to do with crypto. I can either go to, you know, go. I'm already logged into Slack. I'm always logged into Slack. I can either go out and search on things or I can just say DF crypto. And it's going to pull back every company that has either has some sort of mention of crypto in their name and then allow me to view the details on that particular company. And if I want to, I can send it, send it into the conversation. So that's it. In a funny way, that's the whole demo. Right. How we put it together is, the, um, is kind of the trick. So if we go here, this search here, we put in, we, I've already authenticated just using, you know, an API key. You determine which fields are searchable from that particular table. It supports views and stuff like that. And then we have a little template builder here that is fully drag and drop and allows you to, you know, basically define what you want your, you know, your results to look like. It even allows you to define like kind of what the name of this thing is. Is, is it an Airtable? Um, an Airtable record, whatever, you know, whatever you wanted to, uh, to call it. And then search, say which metadata, say what things you want to come, to come back. That's what it is that we're doing here is we're literally saying, take any table, make it searchable. And that's it. Um, use cases on that. If I'm here at, uh, in my fish burners count, so this is, uh, you know, this is my co-working spaces Slack. If I wanted to search for help with marketing, these are going to be all of the mentors that are part of the fish burners program, either through Google or through, um, cause they have a really special relationship with Google or directly, uh, through their own, uh, uh, network. I can find people to, to, uh, set some time with, 
I can get their book a link calendar, uh, uh, book a book a calendar link uh, right there. I don't have to like go hunting down through some other portal. That's what we're doing. We're we're, we're mm-hmm. literally saying let's take every bit of data that's exists in any any given platform and um, connect it to your uh, uh, to where you are. So if you want to build Slack pow- uh, Airtable powered slash commands, that's us. Yeah. As is typical for all product demos, I'm looking for buttons. Um, I can see that you have a back to results button. So Mm -hmm. if you click on one result, you're not stuck with that result. You can go back to your previous search. That's That's cool. Um, Yeah, I like it. I'm also one of those people who is tech savvy and then doesn't use technology. So I don't think in the many years that I've used Slack, I don't think I've ever done a slash command. Wow, um, really? Yeah, I don't, uh, I, I don't belong <laughs> not here. Even a, not even a Giphy <laughs> command? No, I don't. It, it took years to add emojis to any of my bases in Airtable. But <laughs> what, you know, what I'm seeing from DataFetch and what I like about the implementation that you went with is that it's not, you know, the the command is just DF or data fetch. It's not DF Airtable or DF HubSpot. Right. It's DF, and then what do I want to look for? Um, that's exactly right. That's yeah. that that is like the crux of like what we've been trying to do with this thing. Like like when I think about who I built this for, um, I think about the fact that I've worked at almost my entire career has been uh, software companies, and to say I've worked at a lot of software companies, I've worked with a lot of people who are not technical at all. Yeah. So I'm trying to build that, build this for them. I'm trying to build this thing so that uh, when customer success or, or customer support is coming up with things that um, constantly need to be like done as SQL queries by the engineering team. And then, so somebody has to create a JIRA ticket to make that happen and it wastes engineering resources, I'm trying to say, no, 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 no. Let's just train everybody to just say slash DF it and just look for it on their own or provide them a, 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 you know, a query tool on their own that they they can just run for themselves. Um, If I'm, I can, I can actually pull open a, uh, a a pretty decent example of that uh, in Slack. Where is this? You guys are still with me, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So, so in here, this is my like real. Um, this is my this is my day job. Um, my uh, uh, the the Slack community, the, the Slack we have for this company, Goldcast. If I wanted to know all of the upcoming events, and I'm a customer, I'm a customer support person here trying to do. Um, uh, to just like know what should I be worried about? Anybody in this company can type DF upcoming. It searches across multiple systems, and then can quickly run against the Postgres and uh, execute that query and come back in a particular template to show them exactly what it is that they need. Um, we actually we also built them a tool that allowed them to download a specific CSV file. So if they type DF magic, it searches that word, finds only one thing, which is a magic link generator, and it actually prompts them for input. So that's something that we're able to do is actually like that. It's literally an internal tool builder that's no code. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of a, um, it's literally a slack a slash command for getting things that connects everything. Is so- there... I was going to say, is there plans to um, include filtering? Is there any way to like specify only one source or something in your search? It's like you're looking at my roadmap. (laughs) So uh, my roadmap looks like two different things. On one side, there's a list of connectors I want to build. And on the other side, it's bits of functionality. And filtering is absolutely one of them. So you'll be able to pick the table. And then pick the uh, uh, pick any uh, conditions, and then 
all, then separate se separately to do the searching. Yeah. Yeah, I could see even within Airtable, you'd say, I only want to search this space or this table or something. Yeah. What I'm what I'm really chomping at the bit for, and I don't know when, I hope that, I hope maybe you guys will have the inside scoop before it comes out publicly, but whenever they start letting people get access to that metadata API. It's the one thing that we all <sighs> that we all <laughs> want. It's why I only build apps. It, you know, it, that go in the, the marketplace versus, you know, living outside on a separate server. Because uh, if you're building an app, you you get the, <laughs> the metadata essentially uh, fairly easily. And you don't have to do the rigmarole for the metadata API. So that is a that is a feature that we all wanted. We have no clue. Yeah. Or at least they haven't announced it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had a question from Scott for you, Tim. So the search results are for your eyes only unless you choose to send the results to the channel? Yeah, that's exactly right. So if you're seeing what's happening, um, whatever you do, you search for anything. So I'll search for legal. The result comes back and you can actually see that it's all, it, all of this is like only for your own view. It's not, it's not something that, that anybody else can see right now. And then when I view that, when I view this next step here, that too is only for my own view. No one can see that. It's only when I press send that anybody um, can actually see anything. So it's literally, I mean, we took, we, we made a point to basically try and rip off the Giphy um, experience so that we could not have to train people. Yeah. That's good. So if I'm constantly searching for stuff, I'm not inundating you know, the rest of my channel with me <laughs> finding whatever it is that I wanted to find. Right. That's exactly right. I yeah. had a question about the sort of template builder that controls yeah. the sort of look and feel of this result that we have for Anthony. Is yep. there just one template that you build per source or is it, or can you have multiple templates? You get multiple templates and you have multiple searches uh, per source. So if I wanted to add a new source here, like I can you just continue using the same uh, API key. So if like, you know, I'll kind of show you the, the experience. You create a new source, you click new source, you give it a name, right? And so like, I'll call this their table two. I'm very clever. Mm -hmm. And I will copy my API key. And then I have this new source that I can add in new types of searches for. And so all I have to do is paste in a uh, URL or give it the right keys and it will pull down the data, interpolate what it can do about the, uh, um, uh, the metadata that it can, it can ex extract and then uh, allow you to then build a template based on that. Okay. Yeah, it's an interesting concept of the, you know, making Slack be your user interface to everything else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, cause that, that, that's where people are. So you're bringing it to them. It's interesting. Cause this functionality of searching across all of your data sources is inherently valuable, you know, regardless of where your interface is. Um, yeah. Um, how many people need multiple bases to store all their data and having to search amongst multiple bases is, you know, not easy if you're in Airtable. So it, it's cool that you could just do it in a Slack channel. And like, as you were demonstrating, you were in like a separate sort of, I think you were in a message thread with just yourself. So even if yeah. you, you said send, it's a reminder for you and not, you know, filling in with the rest of your channel. So it's not even like a burden on, you know, the, the Slack experience for the other people who may not be needing whatever you're searching for. 100%. Yeah. I, I, that is, that's the thing that I have, uh, I've been like, obsessed with in the past month or so, I've been very focused on trying to find scenarios where, um, like, like how, do, uh, how do we make sure that this doesn't become annoying? And how do we come, you know, like, like 
it can be Slack. Slack has like a very locked down user experience. I have very few options of how I get to present data. So um, I need to take everything uh, that's in my uh, in my toolkit to make sure that like I have a very simple, very self evident experience. And I in like I, I need to make a point to like how many times am I going to send you a notification that you did this or did that? How many times like I so yeah we have we've we're we're Con very conscious of trying to not be an annoying app and just be a useful app. We had an interesting question from our chat from Scott. Um, Scott saying, let's say you do a search for a company from a company's table in Airtable. Can, you, can the search results be customized to include all of the linked employees as well? So basically, if you had a linked record field in Airtable, can it pull or at least show information about those linked records in the result, a uh, little preview. I have an approach to how I want, uh, how I could make that happen. So if, if, a, if, if somebody came to me with like a use case and a budget, to be frank, that was like, you know, we need, we want this to be implemented for real inside of our company, we can find a way to make that happen. It would mean, coming up with our own um, metadata mapping mechanism um, where we'd say, here are all of the fields that are really references to other, other tables and letting you choose, you know, or, or put in a URL for that table each time. Kind of a crappy experience, but we could make it happen. Um, I'm essentially kicking the can on, on making that happen instead of just uh, crossing my fingers, hoping that um, OAuth and metadata API stuff opens up sometime before it's irrelevant or something like that. So that's, um, you know, it's completely possible. We, what we do do like in other platforms where, um, like for instance, uh, Salesforce or HubSpot, uh, if there's a related record, um, we give you the option to expand that record so that you can pull all of the fields from that record too, as long as it is a parent and doesn't have multiple children. The multiple children thing, I haven't figured out a great answer around other than just concatenating all the strings, which is not always that useful. Yeah. I can sort of envision um, like there'd be your results preview that you have. And then if there's a linked record to a, an, an employee's table or something, maybe there's a button that says search based on that and then it does a separate search so you're you know it sort of pre-fills instead of saying employees from the company whatever maybe it sort of pre-fills in what that query is to get there um i don't know yeah 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 but there's there's a lots of different like ways to do yoga or play twister yep. to get there but <laughs> it's just it's it's not easy and i can imagine you know you have to consider things like speed and what sort of load it would be if your company is linked to 500 different rows and another table, well then right. are you loading all 500? Do you need all 500 employees or are you searching for a particular employee at that company to sort of right. extend this thought experiment? So I could see how that would be tough to sort of balance, um, you know, yeah. performance. You want, if you're searching for something, you want your results fast because we're all spoiled. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we have we have an ex expectation that needs to be met. Um, S Scott, I see can I can see he brought up a, a, another uh, comment on this, which is basically the real answer here is that um, you know roll up uh, roll up fields can be used to pull in data from those uh, those linked tables, and so um, then those roll up fields end up. Uh, resulting in um, in text strings that are searchable or at least dis displayable in a in a in an easy way uh, with us. So that's that's generally what we would probably actually ask people to do right now until the metadata comes out. Very very cool stuff, Tim. We're glad uh, to check this out. So yeah, let us know if there's if there's interest. We could. Uh, explore adding this this plugin to the built on air slack group if people want to kind of test that out and see um, what options are there so we'll keep in touch and maybe explore that down the road can i can i by the way can i call it one tiny little thing that definitely is going to come up if somebody ever thinks about this again security yeah. is obviously a 
a, a thing that needs to be discussed when you're talking about pulling data automatically. Um, users have the ability to keep all of their data completely private or they're able to set it as uh, invite only, which means that they can let other people that they specifically choose to be able to, to oh, when they use the slash command, even though they didn't create their own source, they too can search the same thing. So that's how you actually deploy this out to large groups of people. One person can author it and then the entire organization can use it. And then in, you, we also have this workspace visibility, which is functionally the same thing, but also populates it into this data source catalog that we're building out, which basically makes it so that when, if, if a bunch of users want to have public, public resources and allow people to subscribe to it or not, their slash command, they can just say, okay, I'm going to go subscribe to internal statistics, or I'm going to go subscribe to, you know, um, sales metrics. So those are, um, we, we've very consciously thought about like, how do we make sure that enterprise level security is built into the experience without being obtuse? That's very useful. And I think you said it earlier in that you'd worked with several different software companies and going along with that, there's a lot of people who are just not tech savvy. Um, so the it's great that it, it doesn't require that every person in whatever Slack workspace it is or channel or whatever, that they have to go and find whatever their API key is and then figure out what's the table yeah. ID and record ID and, you know, every, Airtable seems simple to me because I've been using it forever. But if I had to do that for every single source, I would be annoyed if every single person in the channel had to do it. But yeah. since only one person has to do it and say, share this information with others, seems like that's sort of taken care of. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be a non-start. And then and that's, that's, that's been the past month and a half is just making sure that that is perfectly smooth. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Tim, for coming on and sharing that with us. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the time. Yeah, no worries. So we will, uh, we got time. We got time. This this will be a quick final segment. Um, before we finish out, just a quick plug. If you're not in our community, please join us at builtonair.com slash join. Tim is in our community and Camille and myself and thousands others. Uh, of Airtable fans, and uh, we'd love to have you join us. So builtonair.com slash join, join in on the Airtable discussion. So we're going to end with a quick uh, scripting time, and we're going to dive into kind of that meta information. One way that you could potentially gather that, it's not ideal, but from the scripting app, you can extract uh, meta information. And um, if you have ever done uh, any kind of scripting, either in the scripting app or in a automation step where you can add a script, um, you realize that if you're dependent on the name of the field, oftentimes you're going to um, change the field names and that's going to break your script or your automation. And I just had a client who you know, wanted to clean things up a bit. And so they wanted to rename a couple fields and lo and behold, that broke all the automations. And so one approach that you can take is to use the field IDs. So every field in your table and every table has a unique identifier. And um, that way, if you use the IDs, then if somebody renames the field, then this ID is going to stay the same for this field. So it doesn't matter what the name is. If you're using the underlying um, field ID, then you can change the name as much as you want and it's not gonna break your scripts or your, or your uh, automations. So it's not as ideal because it's obviously not as legible when you're looking at the code to know what this is. So what this script does is it will automatically generate both a table view and a JSON representation um, of your table in kind of a mapping. And so this JSON is good where I'll just use this and I'll copy this and you can insert this directly into your code that you're using. And then now you have kind of a mapping of the field name. And if the field name, this is kind of what it was at the time of creating um, this, this uh, map. 
So even if the actual field name changes, this doesn't matter because we're going to be using the, the field ID. So this is just kind of a, a one time look up on to, to get the field ID. So it's OK if if the field name changes, even though we might be using this map um, ID. And so let's look at the code to, to how to generate this. It's pretty simple. Um, let's expand this. So the first thing that we do is we're just going to get the current table. So this is a quick shortcut. So even, even better, I don't have to name the table and change it or ask the user what table. Um, it will just whatever table you're currently on, it uses cursor.activetableID and then base.getTable. So now this table references the current table that I'm on. So if you have multiple tables, you can just click to each one and then run the script and it will generate the table for, for that or the, the, the mapping for that table. And then from the table, we're getting our fields and then we're gonna create two items, an object. So the, the squirrely brackets that represents an object and then the um, hard brackets, those are for an array. So we're gonna have a, um, a object and then an array. And then we're just going to loop through all of the fields and we're going to just insert into this map a representation of um, the field name. And I'm doing a little bit of regular expression to replace all um, spaces with an underscore. And then I'm also putting it in all upper caps. Um, you can, this isn't required to do it this way. This is just how I do it. But even then I realized Sometimes if your field name has like other characters in it, I would probably improve on this regular expression to extract out any special characters because um, those typically don't, don't play well within uh, your code. And then I'm just um, setting that to the field ID. And then I'm also creating this array um, and pushing into the array the, the name of the field and the ID of the field. And then um, Airtable has these handy uh, output. So you can just do output.table and pass in your array of items. And then there's a markdown to just create a separator. And then I'm doing uh, output.text and I'm using json.stringify. This might be, if you've ever used stringify, um, if you pass in this two at the end, it will add line breaks. So it'll make it a bit more uh, legible. So this is kind of a nice um, function to, to display legible um, objects and whatnot. So this output will generate, so here's our table with all of the field names with their corresponding IDs. So you might just, if like you're doing a formula uh, or a, um, a uh, automation, you could just copy the field that you want, the ID, and then use that in your code. Or you can take this object here and then insert that. And then now you can, programmatically reference the field by something that's a bit more legible and then just get the ID for that. So two different ways that you can do it um, that can help you. And this helps you avoid the, the issues of every time your name changes, um, automations break. So uh, useful and um, good little script that, that comes in handy that's, that's not too complicated. Any other Yay. tip, Camille, on that? Um, a f a, I want to say a few weeks ago, there was a, a thread on the community forums that had someone with a use case where they had a single select field that had multiple options for done, each in a different color. And they said, I want to make an automation that marks a record as done, a specific type of done, um, you know, with a, the correct color applied. And then there were like five answers that were like, you can't do it because it'll say, you know, if you type in done in that field in an update record step, it will pick the first one and not, you won't be able to specify which color. And I was like, you're all wrong in a nicer language uh, because you can do it if you <laughs> use a script. Because as you pointed out, not just with fields and tables, but your base, your workspace, Every user, every single select option and multi-select option has a unique ID. So if you wanted to go overkill 
and write a script that said, all right, now find the correct select ID. You could have a similar script to this one, which, you know, selects the appropriate table, then gets the appropriate field. You don't need all the fields, you just need the one. And then you find whichever uh, select ID you want for the appropriate color, and then pass that through. You can insert that ID into an update record step or do it all from uh, the script. So it's possible. It's still a bad data structure, but it's possible. Yep. Yep. So yeah, sometimes those IDs are essential. So learning learning how to get the IDs and, and how to use them uh, can help you out in your scripting game. So with that, we're uh, a little bit over our hour, but want to appreciate and thank uh, Tim Alexander from datafetch.io. Check it out. And uh, any Slack stuff i assume they can reach out to you um there or you're also in our community yep. they can find you <clears throat> all right camille good to have you back on and we will see everybody next week and we'd love to see what you're building on air take care thank you bye <laughs>